All right, so endocrinology. Uh, endocrinology is very uh, physiology heavy, so I thought it would be good to put up a review of the physiology. Um, the more you know about physiology as far as hormones go, the better you're going to understand these uh, diseases. It's really, really important. Okay, so what are the hormones we're going to talk about here? We're going to talk about uh, the anterior pituitary hormones, uh, which are FSH, LH, ACTH, TSH, prolactin, and GH, and uh, posterior pituitary hormones, which are oxytocin and ADH. So, um, so the anterior pituitary is otherwise known as the adenohypophysis, and the posterior pituitary is otherwise known as the neurohypophysis, and that's because they uh, originate, they're actually different kinds of tissue, they originate from, uh, from different embryologic uh, precursor tissues. So uh, they actually function quite differently as far as their physiology goes, uh, but they're both uh, part of what looks to be the same structure. So they're both lumped into what's called the pituitary, but they're really different kinds of tissue. All right, so... Uh, first, we're going to talk about uh, LH and FSH. So the hypothalamus pituitary gonadal axis. Why do we call it that? Because the hypothalamus tells the anterior pituitary to do something. The anterior pituitary tells the target organ to do something, and then it releases uh, the the final uh, the final hormone. So hypothalamus pituitary in this case, gonadal. So hypothalamus, pituitary, gonadal axis. So the hypothalamus releases uh, LH releasing hormone. LH releasing hormone triggers the anterior pituitary to release both LH and FSH. They do different things, but for the most part, uh, they operate on the gonads, that being either the testicles or the ovaries. Uh, to release testosterone in the case of the testicles or estrogen and progesterone in the case of the ovaries. Uh, the result of that uh, is going to be uh, changes, uh, sexual changes. Uh, we know that testosterone is ma a masculinating hormone. Estrogen and progesterone is a femini or feminizing hormones. And what they do as well is that testosterone, estrogen, and progesterone when they're in the bloodstream, they have a negative feedback effect on the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary. So they tell the hypothalamus to slow down the release of uh, LH releasing hormone, and they tell the anterior pituitary to slow down the release of LH and FSH. So it's a self-controlled uh, negative feedback cycle. Okay, next. So the hypothalamus pituitary thyroid axis. So the hypothalamus releases thyroid releasing hormone. The, uh, that tells the anterior pituitary to release thy uh, thyroid stimulating hormone. So thyroid releasing hormone causes the anterior pituitary to release thyroid stimulating hormone. Thyroid stimulating hormone stimulates the thyroid, and then the thyroid releases both T3 and T4, and T3 can be converted into T4. Uh, T3 and T4, uh, the thyroid hormones increase the metabolic rate, they increase cardiac output, they increase heart rate, they increase sympathetic activity, and they also reduce the appetite. So T3 and T4, uh, as well as TSH, they have negative feedback effects on the hypothalamus and anterior pituitary. Okay, growth hormone axis. So the hypothalamus releases growth hormone releasing hormone. That causes the anterior pituitary to release growth hormone. And growth hormone has multiple effects on target or organs. Uh, so this one is uh, this one is a little different here. So growth hormone has direct effects on target organs. It also has an effect on the liver, which is to uh, to release uh, insulin-like growth factor one IGF one, and that also has effect on target organs. So uh, we can measure the amount of growth hormone both directly by measuring growth hormone or we can measure it indirectly by measuring IGF-1. 
important to remember here that hypoglycemia is actually going to cause the release of growth hormone, whereas uh, uh, hyperglycemia is going to reduce the release of growth hormone. Okay, and uh, then there's somatostatin, and that has a negative effect on the anterior pituitary for the uh, release of growth hormone. The hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis, so uh, hypo the hypothalamus releases uh, CRH, uh, which is corticotropin releasing hormone, and that has an effect on the anterior pituitary to release ACTH. It also has an effect on the, uh, the it's not really, well, it's part of the anterior pituitary, but it's a different lobe, the pars intermedia, or the intermediate lobe. Uh, CRH causes the release of ACTH. It also causes the intermediate lobe to release melanocyte-stimulating hormone. And melanocyte-stimulating hormone does pretty much exactly what it says. It stimulates the melanocytes, which causes increased pigmentation. ACTH has a, an effect on the adrenals to increase the release of cortisol. Cortisol down regulates the immune system and also stimulates glycogenolysis. Hypoglycemia triggers the, uh, the release of ACTH, and that makes sense because ACTH tells the liver to, uh, to break down glycogen in the muscles. So when you break down glycogen, then you get glucose, and that will uh, re reverse the hypoglycemia. Emotion can also trigger the hypothalamus to release CRH. So that's a good thing to remember. So where this melanocyte stimulating hormone comes in is with Addison's disease. So remember what Addison's disease is, is that the adrenals can't release cortisol. And when the adrenals can't function as they're supposed to, uh, you're going to get a reduced amount of cortisol. And because you have a, such a low amount of cortisol, you've got very low negative feedback on the hypothalamus. And since there's low feedback on the hypothalamus, the, cortico, or the uh, corticotropin releasing hormone is going to be very high, and that's going to stimulate the anterior pituitary to a very large degree, which is going to cause a very high amount of ACTH, but that's to no avail because the adrenals aren't working. It's also, however, going to stimulate the release of melanocyte stimulating hormone. That is effective because that, that's not working on the adrenals, that's just working on the skin. And so in Addison's disease, they can actually get increased skin pigmentation. So that's where that comes from. Okay, the prolactin axis. So this one is going to be really important as far as uh, drugs and their side effects. So the hypothalamus uh, causes the release of what are known as prolactin releasing factors, uh, one of which is uh, thyroid releasing hormone, thyrotropin releasing hormone. Uh, it also causes the release of dopamine. So the prolactin axis is unique in that the primary control of the prolactin axis is dopamine. So what you have here constantly going on is really a negative uh, feedback or a negative uh, uh, stimulation into the anterior pituitary. So at a basal level, the hypothalamus is constantly releasing PRFs and dopamine. The dopamine is going to give a, uh, is going to tell the anterior pituitary to not release prolactin. So as long as in, in normal conditions, uh, the dopamine is outweighing the PRFs and uh, that's causing your basal level of prolactin. Now what can happen uh, is when you have uh, anything that causes an increase in your prolactin releasing factors uh, or that causes a decrease in dopamine, so an increase in the positive uh, feedback for prolactin or a decrease in the negative feedback for, pro for prolactin, uh, you get an increase in prolactin. So remember back to the antipsychotics. Antipsychotics are dopamine antagonists. If you have a dopamine antagonist on your anterior pituitary, then your prolactin releasing factors are going to 
outweigh the dopamine and that's going to cause increased prolactin. So any of the, uh, of the dopamine antagonists, which are the antipsychotics, uh, can cause a, an increase in prolactin. Dopamine agonists, on the other hand, uh, work to increase the effect of dopamine and so that would decrease your prolactin. Now SSRIs and TCAs have an effect because uh, serotonin acts as a uh, prolactin releasing factor as well. So SSRIs and TCAs uh, will also cause an increase in prolactin. Another thing to uh, keep in mind is that hypothyroidism can cause an increase in prolactin, and the reason is because one of the prolactin releasing factors is thyrotropin releasing hormone. And thyrotropin releasing hormone is increased in hypothyroidism. Think of what hypothyroidism is. You've got a low amount of thyroid hormone. If you have a low amount of T3 and T4, that's going to have that's going to re uh, reduce the negative feedback on the hypothalamus, and so you're going to get an increased amount of TRH to try to increase the amount of TSH to try to increase the amount of T3 and T4. But because you can't uh, increase your T3 and T4 because you have hypothyroidism for whatever cause. Uh, you're going to just have a high TRH. And that high TRH is actually going to stimulate the anterior pituitary to release, in addition to TSH, prolactin. So hypothyroidism can cause increased prolactin. So any patient who has hyperprolactinemia, you should get a uh, TSH. Your TRH and your TSH would be high, but uh, you have hypothyroidism because your thyroid is not work, uh, working effectively. Okay, so now we're talking about the posterior pituitary hormone. So the posterior pituitary works a little different. Basically, the posterior pituitary is just a conduit for the hormones. So the hormones, oxytocin and ADH, are released by the hypothalamus. They're uh, created by and released by the hypothalamus, and they go through the posterior pituitary. So the two major stimulators for oxytocin release are suckling and uterine distension as far as what we're concerned with uh, for physiology but uh, other things can cause uh, an increase or can cause release of oxytocin uh, sexual activity certain emotions um, but suckling uh, causes an increase in oxytocin release and that's for the breasts to allow letdown of the milk. It's the prolactin that causes uh, the creation of, of breast milk, but it's the oxytocin that actually allows it to be released. Uterine distension uh, is, uh, causes release of oxytocin, and that's to uh, cause contractions of the uterus and for cervical dilation. And we use pitocin, which is a uh, oxytocin analog, to enhance uterine contractions when we want to assist a woman with delivery. And then there are other effects of oxytocin, uh, namely including the psychiatric effects. All right, and then finally the vasopressin axis. So vasopressin, or antidiuretic hormone, is released by the posterior pituitary uh, in response to a low blood pressure or a low volume state. And so antidiuretic hormone is exactly what it sounds like. It reduces the amount of diuresis or the amount of urine. And that's a good thing when you have a lower blood pressure or lower volume state because when you already have a low volume state, if you're dehydrated, you don't want to be urinating out more fluid. You want to retain your fluid. And ADH does exactly that. So ADH increases the amount of aquaporins in the collecting duct, and the aquaporins are what allow you to reabsorb water. And so by increasing the amount of aquaporins in the collecting duct, you increase your reabsorbed water, uh, you increase the, the concentration of the urine because there's less water in the urine, you have less of urinary volume, but you reabsorb more water and hence uh, maintain your volume. ADH also has a weak effect on the vasculature, increases the peripheral vascular resistance, and that's generally needed too because when your volume depleted, your blood pressure drops. And so this uh, helps you maintain your blood pressure also, uh, not only by increasing your volume or 
maintaining your volume, uh, but also by increasing peripheral vascular resistance. And then there is a negative feedback loop to all this. Now, there's another mechanism here uh, that blocks ADH release, and that is through atrial natriuretic peptide. And this works the exact opposite way. So atrial natriuretic peptide is released in response to an increased atrial volume, which presumably increases the atrial pressure. So if you have a high blood pressure, then the atria myocytes respond to that and ultimately causes the re release of this atrial natriuretic peptide, and this inhibits the release of ADH. Uh, and so you have the exact opposite effect. Uh, so by inhibiting ADH, there's less aquaporins in the collecting duct, and you'll diurese more. ADH is going to be important when we talk about uh, two conditions, SIADH, where you're releasing too much ADH, and so therefore you're going to have volume excess, and then diabetes insipidus, which is basically the opposite. You're uh, not releasing enough ADH, and therefore uh, you have uh, not enough aquaporins, and that's going to cause uh, diuresis, and so you can become dehydrated from that. That is all I have for you. Feel free to write me a note below.